Hope everyone had a nice break. And uh, now we're sort of set the stage early in the morning with the federal panel talking about the, uh, the attention the federal government's getting. And we moved on to um, more of a cross section from NGOs, from uh, a mayor, uh, from policy and from community about some of the, uh, the issues they're facing and then some of the solutions. And sort of to bring it uh, together a little bit more, we are uh, very excited to have uh, some of the top CEOs of, of water companies, which as, as many of you know, there aren't that many large publicly traded water companies here in the US, uh, certainly in, and in, in the Americas in general. And so today I'm, I'm thrilled to, uh, to welcome our panelists, uh, which I'll introduce. Uh, first, we have Carlos Rojas from uh, Rotoplas, which is the largest uh, water-based business in the uh, Central and South America, and uh, somebody who can speak to many of the issues that are being faced in, in those parts of the world, but also moving into the US as well. Uh, we have Ken Bockhorst, uh, who is the uh, CEO, chairman, president, and CEO of Badger Meter, uh, somebody who's trying to digitalize as much of the water uh, infrastructure as he possibly can, which will benefit all of us immensely. We have Patrick Decker, uh, president and CEO of a small water company called Xylem, uh, just down the street here, who can speak uh, about many of the issues uh, faced across water infrastructure. And we have uh, Karine Rouge, from uh, who is the CEO of, of Veolia's North American Municipal Business. Again, another small water company who uh, can talk about a lot of the, the issues as well. And uh, today I'll, I'll pass on to uh, Rachel Wolf, who is a uh, writer, reporter for the Wall Street Journal, who has been getting quickly up to speed on a lot of the water issues and, and uh, hope to, uh, to bring a lot more of them to light to, to a larger audience. So uh, with that, I'll pass it off to, uh, to Rachel to kick off uh, this uh, late afternoon session. All right, thank you. So I've been reporting a lot on our country's water infrastructure, and in doing so, I've been talking to directors of water utilities across the country uh, who all face slightly different problems. We've been hearing about uh, places where there is too much water, like where I live in New Orleans, places where there is not enough water. Like in the West, we have you know places with super old water infrastructure, like Washington D.C. Uh, so the root causes might be a little bit different, but the stories that I'm hearing from every single water utility is the same, which is that there's not enough money, uh, not enough resources to fix the growing problems at the speed at which they're growing. They say that they can't raise rates fast enough to keep up with all of the repairs that are needed. You know, we see Jackson where there's a billion dollar need for investment to replace and repair their infrastructure. Um, where I am in New Orleans, uh, more than 50% of the pipes are past their useful lifespan, which is about 75 years. Um, and so there's a big question about where this money is going to come from. Uh, Biden has allocated $50 billion for the infrastructure bill, but Again, all the different executives I've been speaking to, associations of major water agencies, uh, say that you know it's kind of a drop in the bucket with the, you know, people throw out all sorts of crazy numbers, but a trillion dollar need uh, conservatively. And so we have all of these great company leaders here, and I'm curious how private companies can help bridge that gap, can help create more efficiency among our pub public water systems, and how technology uh, and you know, public-private partnerships um, can help with this funding discrepancy that we find ourselves in. OK, uh, I think, uh, I mean, first you summarize it very well. Uh, I, w I would just react on one thing, on the drop in the bucket thing, because yes, it's a reality. There's a mismatch between the need for investments and the actual you know, funding we get on the Biden plan. But then at the same time, it's an historical moment of awareness around our water infrastructure. And you know, we happen to be celebrating the 50-year anniversary of the Clean Water Act. And in a way, I see this as a very big turning point, like, once in a generation kind of change, you know, of awareness around that. So the Biden plan is one additional drop on a bucket which is kind of filling itself up. 
Uh, and I think that's going to help a lot solve what you're illustrated very well around, yeah, there's a very difficult equation, there's needs for funding, but actually more than funding, I would say there's a need for technical solutions and more bringing the existing technical solutions to the right places uh, with the right level of expertise and the correct governance model. And the solution, and I'm sure we'll dwell more on that, will definitely come with, it's not going to be just solving the right thing, it's not going to be just solving the technology thing, it has to be a collection of all of this, and all of this kind of collective answer will be very local. And how, how will technology, like, you know, if we can hear, you know, how does Badger Meter help create those sorts of solutions that can bring utilities up to speed? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rachel. So, I mean, I think you just pointed out the idea of a trillion dollars to fix the infrastructure. There's another problem, too, and that's that roughly 35 to 40 percent of all the utility workers are likely to retire within 10 years. So it's great that there's a bipartisan effort to try to get some money into the water industry, but it's not enough and it's not fast enough. So I think the role in, in private companies and technology is, you know, we spend a lot of our time trying to figure out how can we enable utilities to do a more efficient job, to get work done with or without people, uh, to be able to save money, to be able to save greenhouse gas emissions. So, so water companies, we spend all of our time thinking about how can we help uh, enable utilities to, to fix these problems. Um, it's, uh, it's a never-ending battle of research and development, uh, potentially acquiring small technologies that we can leverage across you know, the United States or other regions, but uh, I, think, I think it really takes a government, private company, full collaboration uh, to, to get even close to fixing the long-term problem. And Patrick, what is Xylem doing to fill that gap? Similar to what has been uh, said, I, I think that I would go beyond the technology. Uh, I think many of you have heard me say before, I, I don't buy the one trillion dollar price tag. Uh, I think that's looking at things, not on this panel, but that's looking at things to a very orthodox, traditional approach to large engineered projects uh, that are required. The technologies exist today to extend the life of many of the assets that are already out there. The technology exists, exists not just in Xylem, but other companies to help whoever it is, a utility, city works department, uh, a private user of water, whether it be an industrial operation, a commercial building, uh, to build new infrastructure at a fraction of the price of what it has historically, or at least get a better return on the investment, whether it be metrology, whether it be technology being used around managing stormwater overflow, whether it be uh, water reuse uh, within uh, industrial operations. We spend a lot of time talking about the utility side uh, and the government side, and that's critically important. But what's also happening right now is businesses are understanding more and more that the cost of water to them is not the cost of a gallon of water or a liter of water. That's a rounding error to their operations. It doesn't even show up on the P&L. What does is when they're operating in water-scarce areas and they have water disruption and the lines go down and they have economic profit losses, they have to think about dislocating their locations or their operations. That has an impact on communities and societies. So we're also focusing as much on the business side of education to say, you don't need to live your life like that because technologies exist on that side of the market as well as public utility side. Great. Yeah, so may I? Yes. <laughs> uh, um, I, I represent Rotoplast, the centralized um, water solutions business, and we believe in that approach as being a complement to what has been um, the biggest solution, which is centralized infrastructure. And so I, I do think that there's plenty of technology Hopefully there'll be better technology that will make it more efficient, but there's enough technology to solve for the vast majority of the issues. And it's really about being able to implement that technology. And so one of the technologies that's very important is digital technologies, so that the centralized solutions can be implemented and operated at scale. Because 
Um, if you consider that around 30% of new homes are using individual septic tanks that, are, that do not have any sensors or any kind of measurements of, of, of any kind, um, it, 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 it's, it's very difficult to operate what 30% of the population in this country are doing with wastewater. But today it would be crazy not to think that all of those would be um, would have sensors and would be operated in a proactive way and making sure that the out outflow is, is the adequate one. So we believe in a complement to the traditional model. Rachel, if I could just offer up something back on the city works or utility side, and each one of the panelists can speak to this. Um, there are a handful of big challenges that may not be the same for every one of them, but are typically pretty common. That many of, the, many of your readers would not necessarily know these facts. Because they're not fun facts, they're quite sobering facts. First is uh, the impact of a not very sexy term in the industry called non-revenue water. It's the value of water losses due to aging pipelines, leaks, ineffective metering, that was people hijacking water. 14% of all treated water, according to the EPA, more than 50% in New Orleans. Yeah, and that average is closer to 30% around the US and a higher number around the world. What does that mean to the economics of utility and to society at large? Is it's not just the fact that that revenue that's being lost has to be covered through rate case increases, but also, it's the retreating of water that's not been handled efficiently. Uh, metrology is a great example of that where Ken and I both play. But stormwater overflow is another area that is a massive challenge for utilities. And when traditionally designed engineering projects, City of South Bend is one good example, but it's one of many. They had to sign up for an $850 million uh, consent decree to deal with their stormwater overflow in the St. Joe River, using digital technology to build a twin and understand using, using machine learned data on how that distribution network performs during a live storm event, they were able to build now a solution that is gonna be a fraction of that cost. That delta of $550 million is part of that $1 trillion number that's thrown around. And I just think that number puts people in fear, and fear oftentimes leads to a lack of action. Absolutely. Um, well, Patrick just answered what was going to be my next question, so I'm happy to throw it over to the rest of you as well. But I also want to ask, so we heard from Wendy Wilkes about the communities that fall between the cracks. Uh, it is incredibly hard to regulate 52,000 different utilities. I had to stop myself from putting my hand up because that was a fact that I had learned early in my reporting and was shocked by. And it's really hard to get answers to, if you ask a question like, where's the most expensive water in the US? Nobody knows. If you ask questions like, where are pipes most likely to break? What, you know, what cities or communities see uh, the worst infrastructure problems, nobody knows because there are 52,000 of them and it's a massive undertaking to regulate all of it. So I'm curious what privatization, what companies like yours can do for these smaller communities that don't see as much investment, that don't have some of the resources of a major metropolitan water utility. Uh, where is the opportunity there? Uh, yeah, I'll, um, I'll rebound on that one because, uh, yeah, that number is staggering. It's kind of scary for everyone. Uh, and I always thank, you know, Mr. Siegel to introduce by that because it's always kind of, you know. Um, so one of the things that I believe, you know, it's, uh, we talk about consolidation, which is one thing, and we see across the utility industry, and I think you'll spend time this afternoon, like, talking about that. That's a way to basically bring technical uh, expertise as well as all the operational expertise to the smaller utilities for sure. But not everybody will want to sell their system and that's totally okay. Uh, because as we see, as we all know that, there's also a fear of losing kind of a public control of something which is a common good and needs to remain a common good. Uh, for which as well, I mean, as we kind of illustrated the answer around the resource, the quality of its resource, its accessibility, 
it's not going to be you know one single water utility solving it all. It's a an integrating system of which industries are using the water, how do they treating it when they discharge it back, how does the home that have a sewer system, do they maintain it properly? I mean, all of this is ultimately impacting the local resource. So I really believe that, you know, that needs to remain a common good kind of, you know. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, that need for a uniform or at scale operational and technical solution bringing is essential. So that's really where I believe the private sector can help. It's kind of bringing that, you know, it can be technologies, but it can also be, you talk about workforce, which is a huge topic for this industry. Uh, and the ability to bring skilled workers with the correct licenses who can operate the right plants at the right time, uh, it's much easier when you're, you know, let's say a company across the U.S. or a large part of the U.S., and that's what you do for a living. Uh, so I really think that's where, you know, private sector can help buying out the system or offering that scaled approach to technical and operational solutions. Yeah, yeah. and for us, um, so 51,000 utilities, I knew the answer to that too, <laughs> didn't answer it. They're customers of mine, right? So what we think about is I can't, even imagine, uh, to the point this morning, how long it would take to have whatever someone thinks is a reasonable number of utilities. I don't know if that's 10, 15, 20 years. But in the meantime, what we do is we try to understand that we have to service all of the utilities. So we, we try to make sure that our product portfolio and our, and our digital services are able to, to be able to meet small, medium, and large utilities. Like there's all, of the 52,000, only really 500 of them are considered large. You're talking tens of thousands of small utilities that still need uh, companies to fill a gap, fill a hole for them with technology. And I think that's where, you know, Xylem, Badger Meter, others in the industry, I think we do a really good job of trying to do that uh, while we work our way toward, I think, what is a, a better longer term solution. I, I would offer up that um, oftentimes the smaller utilities, it's not just a financial resource issue. Uh, it's a human resource issue. And so any technology that is brought to them, uh, it's gonna take people to implement that, and that takes time. And again, I go back to what are they thinking about in the morning when they wake up? They don't have enviable jobs. Uh, and so one of the things that we're certainly looking to do right now and welcome other thoughts and ideas on this is I think there's an assumption that technology is expensive. And Technology is not always expensive. These can be very, very small capital outlays that have huge returns. But uh, one of the things that we've been exploring and, and doing in some cases is uh, putting our solution at risk. They don't pay for it until it generates the return. Uh, and that gives them the confidence, but then you also have to be provide the human resource support to go in and implement those solutions. And I think that a systemic approach leveraging technologies so that um, where most of this human resources attention is being focused on, if that operation can be um, simplified and it can be done in a much larger scale, then resource allocation can change so that we focus more on, on, on other kinds of issues, issues that haven't been serviced in the past. Absolutely, and I think Patrick makes a good point when it comes to the cost of implementing some of these solutions. And you know, this is really a question for Corrine, but I'm happy to hear from all of you on this, is around affordability of water related to privatization. Because when you think about a for-profit company managing a water system, as a consumer, I'd be worried that my water bill was going to go way up. Whereas I, you know, before, um, I guess not everybody knows that unlike many, the way that many other, say, transportation is funded by taxes, about 90% of water utility revenue comes directly from ratepayers. So all the operating money that a utility has comes from people's water bills. And in most places, there are laws that prohibit raising rates in a wealthy area to help pay for rates in a less wealthy area. Um, which I didn't know before I started reporting on this. And 
It's true that some of the most expensive water in the, com in the country, there is data on this, comes from private companies, not Koreans, nobody here, but... Um, <laughs> but I paid her for that. Yeah. <laughs> but it is a concern that I would have as a consumer. And so, you know, I'm curious uh, where the opportunities are for making water, for, you know, preserving affordability and even, you know, uh, creating more access to affordable water. Um, rather than, you know, yeah. the idea of bills going up further. Um, there's a, you know, if I can step back a little bit from how do we pay for, and just look at drinking water, how do we pay for the water we drink? Uh, we paid one, and you said it, with rates and taxes, depending on how it's structured. Uh, we paid it with bottled water, and it happens to be that we drink and that's, you know, like, just quite data. We drink tons of bottled water, and we drink more bottled water when we don't trust the water we have on the tap. Uh, and we also happen to pay it with health. And unfortunately, in the U.S., we've seen multiple examples, Jackson being the recent one, but not the only one, where there's been water contamination with a whole bunch of, you know, chemicals or toxic materials that have translated into higher health costs. Uh, the reality is, I think that, and uh, I think I got it from one of the podcasts you did where you mentioned the rate increase over the past 10 years, which I think was 49% kind of overall rate increase, something yeah. like this, so right? People's water bills have gone up about 49% over the past 10 years compared to inflation on the whole, which is up about 27% over 10 years. And, and I would really say to that that this is not going to go away. Yes, we're going to do operational, you know, like efficiency. That's essential, clearly. But the reality is we have to pay more on my first category if we want to pay less on the bottled water and then obviously on the health cost of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you compare the cost of, you know, bottled water to tap, I mean, that's like a 1 to 25 scenarios, right? So when you look at a lower income household who has to buy some bottled water because they happen to be black and brown in a poorer type of community. That means that they have a much higher chance to have lead in the water, maybe PFAS or other type of toxic chemicals if their water is coming at the right pressure and isn't brown. Uh, then if we find a way to maybe make their rate increases because we suddenly invest in the system, but they don't have to buy bottled water, then the overall economics will get better. Once I've said that, I also believe that that is a very difficult message to get across. Because what people see, I mean, you get a bill and you compare it to the bill that you were saying earlier, and the whole trust, you know, do I trust my type water? There's a whole bunch of other factors that come to that. You know, maybe you don't like the taste, maybe you haven't been used to it. So the level of education and change we'll have to drive in order to get that dialogue right, I think it's going to take a long time. Uh, so I really think, and here I'm speaking from the water utility perspective, public or private, it's the same thing, that we can't escape from doing a whole different level of rate innovation. And there are things like the federal programs that were put in place during COVID, uh, like LIWAP, which is, you know, great. But it's great, but when you can have access to it, there's only like one people out of four who are eligible to it who actually apply for it. So the money doesn't really get to the people who need it. Uh, so what I'd like to kind of see as an industry is really us starting to put a level of innovation in the rate structures. So you mentioned the subsidy, you know, like within the same type of communities. Um, but there can be other things around volume and all of that where I think we won't be able, I mean, we will we'll have to be creative in that if we want to restore the trust and then be able to drive the dialogue where it should be, which is, around the big infrastructure crisis, water equity, and that's a collective priority for all of us, yeah. Yeah, and for what it's worth, what Karina is saying is also echoed in what I've heard from public water utility executives where there is broad agreement that while water has gone up 49%, uh, it is not high enough at all. Um, and for what a lot of utilities are pushing for is more access to affordability programs, but they say they can't afford to have affordability programs that they're paying for when they can't afford to make necessary fixes. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation, but it is also true that 
uh, there is broad agreement, seemingly, um, that water is actually not expensive enough. And there are so many people who, you know, quite easily afford their water bills. Water bills are a lot lower than other utilities, by and large. Um, so, you know, it's obviously a very complex issue, but Patrick? I'm just going <clears> to <throat> offer up a slightly controversial view. <laughs> Uh, looking, looking at our clients around the, looking at our clients around the world, <laughs> you'll, you'll like this one actually. Uh, this issue of affordability is discussed everywhere, uh, and those countries and communities that we've seen be most successful is when they've moved beyond a view that water is a commodity. When water is a commodity. Everybody pays the same price per liter or gallon, no matter what happens to it, uh, no matter where it is. When water is not a commodity, uh, there are those countries and communities that have put in differential rates. Because again, the value of water is different, depending upon where you are in the overall cycle of water. There's a lot more value at stake for businesses than there are a homeowner. And you've got communities that are underserved. Uh, and they're underserved because their water infrastructure is crap. It's not been invested in. That's a fact. So the only way we're going to break this cycle is one way is pour a ton of more money into it, which doesn't have to be done because we've got technology that can do it much more effectively, and or we, over time, difficult to do, I'm not a policymaker, but we change what the differential value and rate of water is. That's just a really hard thing to do. Some communities are, are doing it. Um, there's actually a big issue in New Orleans around it because some of the biggest water consumers in the places um, that have the worst, uh, the places where water pools the most, like in big grocery store parking lots, are not paying anything right now for water. So it's, it's a big issue. Yeah, there's another and, part of this, though, that's usage. So uh, maybe we'll try to get the audience involved here. So how many people know how much water they use? A few. That's more than I would have expected. You're in a, uh, you're in a water conference. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. That's a great point. So even at a water conference, far fewer than half the people know how much water they use. It's a proven fact, there's studies done on this, that when people have visibility of their water use, they use 25 to 30 percent less. They address leaks, they address problems, they take shorter showers, they don't water their lawn, and that technology exists today. It actually exists in many uh, communities that have access to it but don't give it to their end users. So uh, affordability, yeah, the price probably has to go up, but usage can certainly come down and people can control that a lot more than they realize. Absolutely. Do we have any time for audience questions? Can I just make a quick comment yes. regarding this? Also, the low rates compared to what it really costs, it makes less attractive for the right practice in terms of sustainability, for instance, and which is the cheapest way to get, our, uh, to get water, is collecting rainwater or reclaim. The, the, these solutions are not very attractive if the rates are very subsidized, or technologies to, to, to get information on how much water you're using to, to reduce usage. So I think it's a big, big opportunity for the right practices to take place. We have some questions here. Uh, have utilities considered a progressive scale for water usage, the way wealthy consumers with larger lawns, pools, et cetera, pay more uh, without the issue of law? And I think Kareen addressed part of that. But maybe yeah, and, and today it exists. Uh, it exists in certain states and certain counties, but that's done for conservation. And I think, I mean, I've seen it in other places globally where it's actually used as a way to subsidize, you know, lower incomes because it happens to be, I mean, there's a strong correlation, obviously, if you have a pool in a garden, you're usually more able to pay your water bill than you know, if you have a small apartment, right? Uh, so yes, totally. There are certain states, though, where you can't do that from a regulation perspective. Um, so there needs to be a policy discussion. Uh, but I, I really think this type of scales needs to, you know, I mean, and that's really on us as utilities, private or public, to, to really be, you know, to actually propose that in every rate case. Another great question. Um, 
as visionaries in uh, in the water sector, wh where do you guys see the sector in five years from now, or where would you like to see it in five years from now? Maybe. I would say with a much more relevant role, and particularly in a more attractive way where there's much more players. There's far too few players. Some of the best capabilities coming out of universities, for instance, are really focusing on, let me say, autonomous vehicles, or lots of sexy solutions, and water hasn't seemed to be this sexy industry for this talent to be in, and I would love to see on um, this now taking a much more relevant role. I would, uh, I would add to the theme of uh, engagement of youth. You know, at, at the end of the day, um, we're creating awareness of the challenges, but it's happening the hard way, and that's through the impacts of climate change and aging infrastructure and all the bad stuff that happens. We'll take that awareness, but we'd rather have awareness because we're educating the broader community as to what these challenges are and how they have societal impacts, that we're all in this together. Water is not a commodity. And we want there to be, quite frankly, a movement amongst youth, community leaders, community activists that say we understand the challenges, but we also understand the solutions exist, not just technology, but innovative solutions exist, and we're not going to take no for an answer anymore. It's now their generation that is dealing with the lack of investment and societal dislocation that's occurred over the last 40 to 50 years, despite our 50th anniversary of EPA. We've got a boatload of work to do. Yeah, and, and for me, um, you know, I've always known, everyone knows, it's a, a risk-averse, slow-moving industry, slow-moving pace, but I think over the last couple of years, in many ways, COVID has accelerated some of the technology adoption, and uh, I think we're going to continue to see that. So I'm, I'm a bit more hopeful that five years from now, uh, we won't have solved all these problems, but we'll, we'll be in a much better place and on a better trajectory. And uh, what I would add to that is, uh, and I'm just going to rebound a little bit on what you just said, Patrick, because there's an interesting thing in our industry, which is there's a very high level of complexity because of the, the extremely local dynamic. The value chain is completely all over the place. And what that requires to solve anything are skills like high level of collaboration, like empathy and listening, and which I think are going to be essential to solve anything around climate change. So if we manage to build, you know, to see the, the water industry as a, some type of an ecosystem where we build up leadership skills at every single level of the organization, where we can embark on that kind of complex and transformational change, uh, I think we can have an impact which is, you know, even broader than water. Great. That's maybe 20 years. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, I think we're, we're actually right on schedule. Yeah. So uh, a big thank you to, to all of our panelists. Thank you.